I'm excited again to have another Friday to be talking about sexual violence and how we can prevent it. I am the founder and executive director at Wounded Healers International. And um, I have a, I, I all have a de- dream and passion of uh, disrupting the cultures of sexual violence and changing the perspective in, of how stories are told and to encourage people to, talk, to tell their stories in which of persons that they can. And today is on a Friday every and this is sexual violence awareness month. We're always trying to educate ourselves about sexual violence and how we and hopefully how we can always come together to work in our community in the areas in our houses and and in which wherever we are so that we can all silence the culture of sexual violence and we can continue to supporting survivors and our neighbors or survivors or sisters or brothers or family members or even the people that we don't know around the world sexual violence is um a uh, global problem and I always say it's worse than COVID because um, COVID had vaccine and sexual violence does not have vaccine but the good thing is that we have the tools that we can use to prevent sexual violence. So welcome to our live today with me and our guest today I'm going to be bringing her in in a minute but our topic today we are going to talk about parent survivors. We know that the sexual violence um, has lived in many generations that have gone and most hopefully not hopefully the generation to come so my guest today is going to talk about herself and she's going to talk about the parent survivors and how parents can support their children and also how they can heal themselves so with that i am going to be bringing in my guest and she's going to introduce herself so thank you so much, uh, Mandy, for coming to our live today. You so much welcome to be at Wounded Healers Community Space and Wounded Healers International. So Wounded Healers will our organization or our live will be in Kenya and in here in USA. So feel free to join in and uh, go ahead and introduce yourself if that's fine. If you're ready now okay sorry nuna hi hi how are you i am doing good it is so good to see your face i'm a little nervous <laughs> but i was like, so like so excited when you invited me to do this because i have so it's much amazing. respect and admiration for you so thank you for having me thank you so much so um i will invite you to tell us about yourself what you do where you are in this world and um what you're passionate about yes okay so my name is mandy maloon and i currently live in san angelo west texas um i'm 42 years old i'm a single proud mom of a nine-year-old daughter um a quick recap of my past um i started training in taekwondo at the age of seven And by the time I was 13, I was a really big time athlete living at the Olympic Training Center, fighting all around the world with the adult team. And it was pretty exciting, but it was also where I experienced a lot of abuse and things, terrible, terrible things that happened to me within the sport and within my organization. And so I retired, became a mom, and then I became a part of this amazing company called Pave Prevention that I work with under my boss, Arlene Lemus, where we go into companies and we train their staff against anti-harassment, anti-violence. And that's just a little bit of information of my story and my background. Thank you so much. You started by mentioning your Nava, so calm down. I know. interview, just take a deep breath and land in this space however you want to land is uh we our goal here is to just educate the community however that come out however it is and it's a hope that the the conversation that we're gonna have will go to the person who really need it so i love that so just calm down relax and it's gonna be all right 
um, thank you so much for telling us um, or sharing about yourself. It's amazing. It's a very, very amazing that you got to be with us today, and especially from Texas. And so many have not been into the U.S. And it's a dream for everybody to to be in the U.S. So before we dive into uh, difficult stuff, tell us how is it being in Texas? How is the weather? What's going on in Texas? What's the time right now in Texas? Right now it's noon, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And I grew up a military, we call it a military brat. My dad was in the military, so we traveled constantly and I loved it. And when I did Taekwondo, I went all around the world and I somehow ended up in Texas. And they, it's a joke. Once you end up in Texas, you stay in Texas. Texas, uh, the people are pretty special. Um, it's very hot here. We really, really don't have any cold. And what I'm so excited about is my daughter gets to experience. She was born here, the same friends, the same school. And I think it's wonderful. She gets to have that. Oh, amazing. Oh, yeah. So if it's known, in, uh, in Kenya right now, where most of our audience are, I think it's 8 p.m. at night. Oh, so, okay. Uh, How are you? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, and those are the things that I really admire and grateful for in life, that we live in this wonderful world, the planet that we've been given, but we get to experience even time different in time, in, in different way. And I think, um, us having this global conversation and our conversation of wherever you are in the world and coming together and discussing about this animal, this, not even animal, I don't think even sexual violence would be animal. Animals are good, but yeah, I think um, us joining together uh, and working or advocating and talking about sexual violence is very important um yes. you said you did you did taekwondo and um you traveled a lot i don't know whether you got yourself to go to africa or do you have plans to go to africa tell us about that um i know and i believe you can correct me if i'm wrong but egypt is still considered i believe very north and i've never been south and i've always wanted to go south that was that's always been like a dream Welcome so. to Kenya. <laughs> yeah, I want to make sure that our audience understand I'm in Maine, USA, the north part of uh, America. It's 1 p.m. here and um, it's warm. It's nice and warm now. We're getting to summer, so the, the globe is tilting to our favor. So that's very nice. And um, but one thing that I know we are all connected by one thing that's love in our soul that we get to uh, to share everything that we have. So before I still don't want to go deeper to the conversation of today because I know people always I want to bring that hum humane part mostly. I want us to talk about your taekwondo. Like, what does that mean? Do you fight? Do you like throw? Can you fight? Like, how? What's taekwondo? Okay, so Taekwondo originated in Korea, and I like, I'll describe it as, you know, in the movies when everybody's like kicking all the cool jumping, kicking crazy, it is mainly kicking, but it's also a little bit of boxing. It's full contact, and it's like fighting. When I, I mean, when I trained, it was full contact with men and, men and women, coming up as a fighting men and women as, like, as a young girl into my adulthood. Yeah. That's why my nose goes like this and then goes like that. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I see some people writing to me from Africa asking uh, whether you can fight now. You can still fight. Is those skills now that you don't fight? Do you still have skills within you? Are you able to fight? Um, well, going a little bit back into my story, I was the number one in my U.S. getting ready to go to the 2008 Olympics. But right before then, I had reported all the sexual and physical violence that was happening to me and my teammates. And I was removed from the team and threatened that if I didn't take these accusations back with proof, that um, I would never fight again. So I have been retired since then. And if I wanted to go kick and punch a bag, Nuna, I'm telling you from the age of 7 to 27, I trained nonstop with a little break here and there for the holidays. But it was eight hours a day five days a week. So I, I could still, I could still kick and punch, but I don't train currently right now. Mm, no. Amazing. 
Amazing, yeah. I believe you can. I've seen you kick and punch, so <laughs> <laughs> I know you can. <laughs> I still, I still got it. Okay, just a little yeah, bit. You still have it. <laughs> so let's talk about um, briefly or how, however you feel comfortable about your experience. Uh, if if that's something you want to share, like what happened and why it ended up you stopping your career because of speaking up. Absolutely. Um, because we only have so much time. So by the time that I was 13, my parents didn't have a lot of money, so they couldn't travel with me and go all these. I mean, we were all around the world. So they sent me off to a place, uh, an institution that they trusted, which was the Olympic Committee training place. And as I so as soon as I stepped on those grounds, I was being uh, sexually assaulted and raped and harassed on a nonstop basis. And mind you, I was 13 years old. You know, my parents were very far away. Um, on top of that, what people don't understand is that a lot of times these kind of behaviors and these assaults are supported by, you know, the, uh, the community, the people, you know, that were around me, the adults, the coaches. They were all a part of it in a general sense, if that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So, and on top of all of that, I'm, I'm an 80s baby. My dad was from the military, very tough, and he never had these conversations about what to look out for or what sex was about, you know, when someone's inappropriate with me. that I just did not grow up in a time. So I felt a lot of shame. I was afraid to tell my father because I thought I would get in trouble. Thank you so much, Mandy, for sharing that. And, yeah, I with the child abuse and child sexual violence it happened number one to the people that you trust and like uh one of the things that we try to teach is um is the grooming that happened because like children don't have a lot of power and they have to follow up or if somebody say they are under control of somebody and the people that you really trust and especially i can imagine if i was your parent at that moment parents want the best for their kids so they want to send you to the best school to the best place they want to expose you to maybe the life that they did not get so once they send you they put that trust and you know like in africa parents are gonna sacrifice themselves we live in a very poor place so parents yeah. sacrifice themselves so much to send a child to school so if you're sexually harassed in school you even you as a child you look back and see how your parents are sacrificing for you to be in school you feel even embarrassed and also now add on top like uh your situation is your dad was already a military was somebody who is not to many approachable because you know they used to be tough they're tough people so you can imagine even before abuse happened, you don't even have a lot of interaction. So you're not going to go and say, oh, this is happening to me because you don't even know what the response would be. So I think so, so much of uh, child abuse happened, like we say, from the person that we know and the person who mostly is trusted by our parent or by our family member. And that's the, the I think, the, the most vulnerable or easy way for perpetrator to wave themselves into children and they go on and abuse them so moving forward is like how has been your journey since then since you you oh, oh let me let me refresh my question when did you speak up or after all that how did you end up like saying no this is enough and enough like what came into you so that you can be able to speak up well, what was very interesting and because I was trying to describe it's not just about you being the victim or what was happening to you is how everything around you supports you being victimized. It makes it harder for you to get out from a very young age. I always because I traveled a lot. I was always, you know, pretty much the only kid with all these adults. So you're teaching yourself in a lot of ways and you're observing everything. Right. Because you're a kid. And I really did realize even then, then with my coaches or my parents, sometimes like, oh man, this is not good. This is not healthy. This is not right, right? You feel it in your soul, but these are the people who are raising you, taking care of you. You can't get out. But as I grew up through the system, it kept happening to me. And then it would happen to the people that were younger than me and close to me and they would come to me. 
And so when I felt strong enough and what I thought was like in a very strong position, I was number one in our country, right? I'm a, the number one athlete. I'm the toughest girl. If I tell my story, they have to believe me, right? Mm -hmm. And it did not go, it absolutely went the other way. But I also had a feeling it wasn't going to end well for me. But I knew because in the US, and I'm sure it's, uh, for, you understand this. I put every documented everything in paper and I filed my report and I knew that report in paper would be there forever, no matter what happened. So that's that's uh, initially how it happened. And then one day I lost everything. And that that included uh, my friends and family because they were threatened. They were scared. They didn't understand me because I was disrupting everything. Right. I'm disrupting mm -hmm. everybody's lives, the community. I'm putting on a spotlight on something that is horrible and nobody wants to talk about. So I, it was a horrible time for me. Yeah. I think um, I'm proud of you being brave enough to even think about documenting and having being ready to fight for yourself. I think that's so brave of you. And um, uh, I am I'm so proud of you for that. Uh, I, I think like when sexual violence is happening to so many people, having even words like I, i'm a survivor of sexual violence and i didn't know that was it at that moment it took me so much time when it was happening to even put a word on the situation because it's so normalized in the community yes so it's a normal thing especially you know you're 13 years you are a teenager everybody says that you know it's a hormone you're growing up when you try to speak you're speaking against the, the the victim blaming, especially when you're a teenager. Everybody blame you. And again, like what I can hear from your kids, you you're talking, you're speaking up, including like it's a nation thing. You are an athletic from the USA, the biggest country, and now you're putting spotlight of all these things on. on. I can imagine how insecure it would be even for you because you're like. I can, if you are um, a top, that means that I, you are known all over the nation. And yes. the US, now all of a sudden you're coming up, these young girls saying this, uh, uh, that she has been abused. So I think sexual violence, especially for kids, young people, put them in a spot of insecurity because you, again, like I said, you depend on somebody. Can and I add, Nuna, real quick, can I add a couple of things just so yeah. I don't forget? Um, the number one thing, and this was what blew my mind because I was really thinking about it. And I'm like, you know, 2007 wasn't that long ago. And the biggest reason I reported it, and to me, these were simple things to ask for and demand respect for. I asked that I had control over my own body, body physically and in training, control over my money control over controlling the own weight of my body because we fought, you know, weight divisions and they would abuse us that way. Um, I asked not to be raped when we went on these expensive, fancy trips. I asked for them to get me an education. I asked for them to get me therapy to heal. And they told me, no, that's what happened in this country in 2007. And that really blows my mind. It's, it's scary, you know? And like you said, 2007, it's not a long time ago. No. It's just another, it's 15 years from now. Yeah. And you, like, still in America, in this big, big nation, mm -hmm. some a, a kid did not get justice. When this kid was ready to speak about themselves, you know, speak up and looking for help, and it didn't come. That's so, that, I, I mean, that's sad, and that's very disappointing for such a big nation to not, do that so if in kenya there's so much about early marriages you know female genital mutilation mm -hmm. and um and especially now because of the inflation and poverty that's there there's so many cases of girls and young kids that get in situation covid19 got so many kids go through sexual abuse because you know, they are in the same houses, the same room with every yeah. adult. And so that continued happening. And it's sad, like, that get to uh, to happen to our community, to our kids. Now, yeah. you say that you, you started by saying that now you have a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can see the smile. Let's see if she's the part of the joy. And I hope she is. 
um, I I want our our conversation today is parent survivor. You are survivor in your parenting another child. Yes. And you and now you're parenting a girl, not even a boy. A girl, yeah, a girl <laughs> child. And I remember when I was pregnant, I was terrified and I was praying for a boy. And I God was like, Nope, here's your girl, and she's just like you, you know, be blessed. And she is oh. my she is my biggest blessing. She saved my life. She's my heart. And when I was an athlete, I mean, honestly, the only when I got out and got therapy, the only two things that I could relate to in therapy were soldiers, you know, soldiers coming yeah. out of war and people from cults. Those were the only two things that I could relate to. And in Taekwondo, we were always it put in our brain, you better not get pregnant because you ruin your career, right? Mm -hmm. So I never planned or wanted children initially. And then I had my daughter and uh, she changed my life. I'm so happy to hear that. Tell us, like, what? how was the transition for you mentally when you realized that you're pregnant and, um, you know, you knew what you had gone through. And of course, you got, a, you got pregnant you know, through having sex with a man, like, mm. how was that for you as a parent who had gone through, as a girl who had gone through sexual violence? I will be very honest. When I was pregnant, um, and you know trauma, Nuna, and you know how trauma affects the body. I, could, I couldn't connect with my body. I wasn't a happy pregnancy. I honestly look back and think I obviously was very depressed because I'm always outside of myself. You don't want to feel your body. Even my own family... <laughs> told me after they were very worried how I would connect with my daughter once she was born. But the second she was born, we were bonded. And mm. that, that mother, that mother instinct kicked in. Uh, Cause I mean, that's just my nature. And hopefully for women, that's how, you know, it should be. But I know this is an honest thing coming for me. I have had n not a relationship or any sexual contact in 10 years. And that is what, it's like abstinence. That's what works for me, but it's still very much a part of my trauma. And I'll explain it just a little. Some people think that maybe rape is about sex, right? Mm -hmm. But for me going through this, um, it, it destroys your nervous system. It destroys a lot of, a lot of things. And the way I compare it to is if somebody literally like released when they rape you or assault you, they literally release a bomb inside of you, right? And that's the only thing that I can kind of explain what happened to me. And, I, and I'm still working through that. But I take medication because I have panic attacks and nightmares. And yeah, so it's an ongoing, lifelong recovery process. And people who don't understand are always like, get over it, you'll be fine. But it literally my everything manifests my anxiety, physical, I feel everything physically, it's not just mentally. Mm -hmm. And it and it, it can, it's exhausting, you know, and I know you understand that. I do, I do, Mandy. Yeah. And, yeah. and if you're listening to us, and you can relate to the story or whatever we're talking about today, mm -hmm. and you're wondering how you get you, you are able to get over it. I want to remind you that healing is a is a life journey, is a long process that we have to live with it. And it's okay. You don't have to look like somebody else. You don't have to get over it. You can just process your trauma just the way you feel okay for you. And you it's even if you look at people survivors who are going to be quoted in your life, like somebody, this and this person was raped and now she got over it, and you should be like that person. Just know you are an individual person and you do not need to compare yourself with anybody and trauma is not competition and it's not the same. You have your own journey. Everybody has their own journey to, to go through. So take care of yourself and don't allow or don't allow yourself to, to compare yourself or feel as if you're slow in healing. So, Nuna, Nuna, I'm going to say two kind of heavy things but this is my personal experience i've said before the strongest thing i ever did was to get through it like i could not stop it i was like the toughest like mike tyson woman or man in my sport but i still got attacked mm -hmm. repeatedly there was nothing i could do but get through it and the other thing is i had two very close people to me take their lives right and they got judged for it 
but I understood it because their pain, it's physically painful constantly to relive your trauma, to be depressed, you know, to use drink or drug because you can't manage. So I understood it. And people need to understand you don't just get over it. You're not weak. Thank you so much, Mindy. What's one thing that you want to tell a parent who is taking care of a child who have gone through sexual violence? Um, yeah, that's what one of my questions. What's the message would you like to tell a parent who is taking care of a child who have who have gone through sexual violence? That the parent has gone through the sexual violence? Child, a parent taking care of a child who has come and said that they have been abused. Oh, the child's been abused? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, you need to believe them. You need to get whatever information at whatever level of age, and you need to immediately report it to the authorities. And I'm in the U.S., and you're in the U.S., Nina, but I don't know how it works in Kenya or anywhere else internationally. And, and a lot of places aren't safe to report. So it depends, right? Um, and also, you, you have to immediately get them some kind of medical help, help or therapy and keep them separate from whoever is the abuser. And I hope that's a bit helpful. Yeah, that it is. So in Kenya, we have um, delays, and I believe all over the world, like like even in the U.S., survivors of sexual violence don't get justice, even if they're they're big, they're adults. So in Kenya, there is a lot of weight. Like there are no there are no system or structures well strong to protect survivors of sexual violence. So. So most of the time we have uh, when a child or anybody go through sexual violence and try to get justice, uh, they don't get even to have their documentation made. When we started Wounded Healers, and you know we run a city of peace shelter that provide rescue for survivors of sexual violence, we, re we did a survey to walk around or like local administration, police station to just have a, an insight or uh, information about the data that they have for cases of sexual violence. Because where we are has like our shelter, people walk in and out and telling us they are survivors and they really, really need help. And we were like, okay, so let's go to the police station around and see what the data they have. They do not have any data. Of course not. And when we asked, we were like, because we are registering 30 people who have been abused like why how come there is nothing and they said those are family issues to be dealt at, dealt at home you know so in kenya there is a lot of something we call kangaroo court like we yeah. don't take things out we, yeah. we just solve the, those one so justice system in kenya and even the few that have managed to report they don't get just it will take like nine years before you uh, before you get justice uh, imagine if you're 13 years it take nine years it's exhausting die. yeah you don't want to do that and i'm glad you segue because here this is what i was gonna say no matter what happens after the your child comes to you the most important thing is that when they do tell you you are present you believe them you take care of them and you love them because the way you treat them in those moments is going to affect the way they see the world and how they go out into the world because you are the number one place that everything starts with and you know what i'm talking about and the That's other cool. thing yeah police whatever but if your mother or father don't believe you you know uh you're going to be a victim for the rest of your life they're not going to be able to be completely whole and the other thing in the us that we have and it's still prevalent is a lot of families have the weird uncle right so uh, your kid is telling you this, you know, uncle's doing this or that, and you, they just cover it up. They shame you. They don't say anything. And that, I mean, even here, that's huge. And it's just unfortunate, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's powerful. And that's huge. And it's like, I am all like in my mind, cause I'm in the U S I'm, and I'm from yeah. Kenya. I keep comparing these two scenarios and I'm like, damn, like, yeah. In the U.S., like where we hoped, like all oh, the system should be working, and it's um, it's something that makes no. me remind me like it's our duty, everybody's duty, because the government or the justice system is failing us. The teachers, mm -hmm. the, the the leaders are failing us. So it's our work right now to start against sexual violence and to be able to speak about it.
and not to continue, you know, hiding it under the carpet as as as, as it come. So, um, should, we do a lot of prevention education in Kenya. So, where were by, you know, the term sex in Kenya is no word that it's gonna be mentioned. And you know, when you don't mention sex, you, yeah, you, you hiding everything else. It's and it's another avenue for people because it's a it's a it's a shamed topic already. Yeah. So we teach uh sexual child sexual violence prevention in school where we. Once we go to school, we use songs. We use um, oh. the teacher tells us not to call um, the pennies, you know, vagina. Yeah, yeah. Give them different names. Age appropriate, it's, right? It's very inappropriate to say that. So the kids. One day, one of our program manager said they are teaching, and the kid when they say those like pennies, the kids are like yeah. hiding, and they were like. One kid said, that's what he told me, you know, that's what he told me. And now the conversation came and that child was being abused over and over again. But, you know, so this, this is an inappropriate. You don't say that. Yeah. So I, I, I still have another question of, a, of uh, you as a parent and taking yeah. care of a child now. Yes. And, um, how what what is it like for you like what kind of advice or do you talk to your daughter every day to because you're not with her all the time she leaves go to school and what is it like what kind of conversations do you have with your kid now about the world and about the life of uh, sexual violence um obviously you know with her age i keep it age appropriate during the different different stages but my daughter's almost 10 and she's very intelligent she's very willful like she wants to do something she wants to do it and i've had conversations you know inappropriate touching sex whatever but i believe i caught her one time you know trying to jump the fence and take off in the neighborhood and i was uh, very scared right i was terrified because nowadays you, in in texas pretty much anywhere now, you can't just let them run all over the street by themselves. So I did put a little bit of fear of God and I got very detailed about what would happen to her if somebody took her and I would never see her again. And I felt like that was necessary at that mm -hmm. moment. But also it's like, I can't, like you said, I can't be with her 24 seven. So you just got to keep, you know, giving them that knowledge and you got to talk to them. You got to ask them about what's going on and who they're around at school or what, you know, and what's going on in their lives. I don't think, and I get it because we're all so busy and tired and, but you, you know, really knowing what's going on with your child. So. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's, that's very important because sometimes we get as parents, we get to be so busy looking for money, you know, inflation is going high. We're yeah. running again, uh, after the money. And my mama used to, to tell me, I am looking for money to educate you. I, I yeah. don't have time. I don't have yeah. time to talk. Like, you know, or are we going to eat the talk? You know, those questions. So sometimes a, a child, and you know, like age of uh, biologically, a child developed between 13 years and 27. So that's the time the development of the brain is happening. So the child can observe and see the absent parent or a parent who is so involved in their life or a parent who fight the children as a bother. If yes. you are that parent, the child is not going to come to talk to you. Well, Nuna, Nuna, you know what the most important thing I did that helped my daughter and mm -hmm. I'm still doing it and I'm not perfect. Um, I'm in recovery. I'm in therapy. I take medication for my post-traumatic stress. I do the work because if I don't do the work, my uh, not being there, being angry all the time because of my trauma, or being depressed, I can't get out of bed or work is going to affect her. And she, they, you have a child, they watch everything that you do. So number one is get the help you need, whatever that looks like. No judgments, but you got to do it. Mm -hmm. Especially if you are a parent. Yes. Trying to help a child who is coming to tell you that they have been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. If you've not taken care of yourself, you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to take care of that child. And a child okay. can see, a child can watch, a child can see and can relate to that we have uh domestic sexual i mean domestic violence is very very huge in kenya mm -hmm. so there's a lot of and when i say domestic violence i mean men beating women yeah. 
in front mm -hmm. of children, a lot of, of fires. Yep. So these these children grow up. Those that make number one, these kids very vulnerable to cases or to people or to sexual violence. But they already know the the home. My mom is already being beaten. Like this is not a conversation that I'm gonna add on top of my parent because it's gonna bring the fight. So when these children watch you fight, they when, when these children watch you speak from your mouth very very bad things and use the terms that are very inappropriate and you know. They, that's what they do and they keep to themselves and the more they keep to themselves you don't know what's going to happen and they end up you know having cases of mental health issues right we're having it right now with adults that they were didn't take care of themselves when they were growing up and then they grow up they just don't know how to deal with their emotion and they become violent in well life. trauma number one and there's science behind it there's a wonderful doctor um that we've talked to trauma changes everything in your brain, especially for children. On top of that, visually, you're not learning the right skills and how to communicate and how to, you know, treat people. The other thing is I would tell my brother all the time because it wasn't just Taekwondo. We had some trauma in the home and abuse. Um, our level of what's normal or what's bad was so high that we were willing to get ourselves in situations and accept things in relationships that a normal person would go, oh, no, you know, which was a lot of violence, you know, domestic violence, stuff like that. So that's the number one thing, like take care of yourself, you know. Yeah. I really encourage, uh, especially a parent, and not necessarily because you've gone through sexual violence or domestic violence or any form of gender-based yeah. violence. If you feel like your emotions are not in the right place and you're taking care of children, please take care of yourself. Go see a therapist, go talk, find some that, somebody that you can trust and share Yes. What you're going through so that this child can have a platform to uh to be able to come and talk to you and feel confident that you're gonna listen to you. Don't get so busy always. Get like few minutes to ask your child how they are doing. Children, once you ask a child, how are you doing every yes. day? Is they gonna you're gonna build those relationship with them and they're gonna be looking forward to telling you what they're do, they're doing. And again, I'm not saying that you be so much into their life, especially if they're a teenager and you're yeah. also teaching, you know, <laughs> respect the boundaries if they're in their room, go knock, even if it's in your own house. Just yes. don't go bang the door and go inside because that's your house and you wanna be uh viable for your kid. Please respect their boundary. By you respecting that, you're teaching them to also set boundaries once they go outside. So I encourage you to take care of yourself. Absolutely. The, the other question as we go almost finishing our conversation, the other question that I have for you is um, one message that you have for a survivor of sexual violence all over the world, especially those who are silently watching and not knowing what to do you know they feel there's that when you listen to another survivor you feel like you're ready to talk you know you feel it at that moment but one conversation is over you go down to your hiding place what's one message that you have for them the the one message that i would have and if anybody's listening or will listen later is that you are absolutely not alone absolutely not alone i'm in texas nuna's where she's at um, it's being broadcasted in Kenya as well. It doesn't matter, you know, your job, your nationality, where you're at, you're not alone. And it happens to everyone. And the, the biggest thing that saved me was my anger and my rage. Do not shut that out because then you'll go into that de depression and shame. Use that, you use that to push forward. And, um, as a, as a parent, I always tell my daughter, I'm your mother. I'm your parent. I am not your friend. You know, my job is to be there and be strong and take care of you. And that's another thing that I still struggle with. You know, I, I have a lot of shame um, because I don't want to hurt her. But by not teaching her and setting boundaries, I, I will hurt her. So I hope all of that makes sense. Um, I thank you, Nuna, because this helps me in my recovery to, to speak because a lot of times I carry a lot of my anxiety here and I and I don't speak and I'm still working really hard on that. So thank you for giving me a pl platform to share my story. 
thank you so much and just so you know so many people are gonna listen to this and so many people are gonna be inspired and the reason that i always want to bring in people is because even if we're just gonna help one person we're gonna continue doing this work and it's our job and it's my dream that one day wounded healers will not be needed and it will not be existing because it will there will be no sexual violence if that day come tomorrow i'm ready to shut off the organization and go look for it job but as long as people are coexisting with each other and we are not respecting one another and as long as we're here we are going to fight to end the cycle of sexual violence wherever we are in a capacity that we can so mandy i'm so honored to have you today but Thank what? you. I have one last question. Give and I one. have one, yes, give me one more question. I have one last comment that is near and dear to my heart and very important. Okay. I'm gonna ask you that question one day. If you were to change something in your life, what's that one thing that you would have to, you would change? If I any if I could change anything in my life, is that the question? Yes, if you can change and just one, one Ooh, thing. That's so, that, that's so hard because I could be really selfish and say something for me or I could be cool and change the world. What would I change? Nuna, I would, oh, I would stop, honestly, just the selfish, I would stop time because I keep getting these like Facebook past pictures of my daughter being so tiny and a baby and she's growing so fast. So if I could just stop time mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. I would do that. She's growing up way too quick. I love that. And I, I and I read it to the, my son is 15 years old. Oh, uh, that's crazy. He's all he's like almost a man. That's Yeah. Yeah, he's 15 years and I think what cuz I don't have a lot of you know memories of of his childhood and I'm like I miss that. I miss that point of relationship with my child. So when I see people enjoying their kids and I'm like, yeah, that's so cute. Uh, and I really relate to that. Sometimes you want to hold a baby and just, you know, they're growing. And, Wait, and Nina, why don't you pop out one more? You can do uh, it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I to know if I can, I'm going to wait and I when it's the right time for for God to give me maybe yeah yeah when is the right time it will happen oh my gosh it'd be the cutest baby in the world <laughs> my last comment I will never men or boy shame they can be abused and victimized as well and they you know you're doing that work you're teaching them too and so it, it's to include everyone violence affects everyone and we need everyone every gender to learn and to love each other and open their eyes and take care of each other. So remember that. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to have known you and we're gonna continue. And I can't wait to get to PAVE prevention. And I'm hoping that I can take all of you PAVE prevention to Kenya so that we can teach empowerment and we can do amazing work in Kenya and all over the world. So well, we're going to we're going to have a paved train the trainer where you're trained in person in October and I would love if you would come cuz you would be amazing. At I would. I will. Mean, yes. I will. Mean. <laughs> yeah, so I'll give you that information, but I really missed your laugh and your face and I'm just so happy that you're my friend. Thank you so much. We're going to end our, our broadcast for now. If you have a question, reach out to us in Kenya and in Maine. Check out our website at www.woundedhealersinternational and all social media followers on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and all of our uh, send us messages and we'll get back to you. Thank you so much.